We're back for another week of the OC Office Hour in-season podcast where we share some ideas that can help you right now and in, in season uh, where we have a different offensive coordinator joining us every week. And this week, we're honored to have the offensive coordinator of the San Antonio team in the XFL. He's got over 20 years of coaching experience, a lot of that as the offensive coordinator ranging from high school to small college, to the FBS, professional level, in the CFL and the XFL. We're going to have a lot to pack into this episode today. Our guest, we're honored to have him, Jamie Elizondo. Jamie, great to have you here. Keith, man, thanks for having me on. Really excited to join you and appreciate you taking the time to spend some time with me. So to put a focus on this, we're looking at, in general, situational football and how it relates to getting the game to the fourth quarter. And we look if we look at the NFL this weekend at the highest level you really start to see these things come through I think while you always you know I I know as a high school coach I always say well those I don't have those kind of guys right college coaches could say that too but what you can learn from these games is the management of the game and and the thought processes that go in to winning a football game right NFL it's really tight the the between the top and the bottom uh, there's there's not a whole lot of room for air. You look at it right now. There's a lot of parity. A lot of teams in the NFL at two and two coming out of week four. So uh, a ton of takeaways I think as we get into this conversation today. So I'll let you kick it off here with what you've been thinking about in this regard. Yeah, I know that's a that, that's a that's a great uh, point, Keith. And you know, just looking at the NFL, I watched a couple games you know over the weekend, and I read somewhere that. This past weekend, with the exception of the Chiefs and Bucks game, all the other games were one-score games in the fourth quarter. And I'm, uh, you know, that article that I read also talked about how 49 games this year in the NFL and, and early in the season have come down to or have been one possession, one-score games in the fourth quarter. So it really talks to the importance of situational football throughout the game, decision making as a coaching staff you know, on a, on a number of scenarios, when to go for it, when to take points, when to, when to use the analytics, uh, how do you communicate as a, as a staff when stress is on the line? All those things, you know, were, were pretty exciting to, to watch this past weekend as there was a number of games that really came down to the final minute and uh, some key decisions there, you know, for, for, all, for all of us to learn from, right? Because that's really the beauty of it is when we watch these games, whether it's college or high school or pro football, you're really looking at the decisions as coaches. We look at the decisions that other coaches are making, right? And it's easy to second guess and 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 say, well, we should have done this or I should have done that. But what's really exciting and, and what we want to talk about a little bit is what goes on behind the scenes, how you get to those decisions, how you prep your players to understand those situations, how you manage the momentum swings that come from those situations. And I I always call it kind of the the hit of momentum in the game when those decisions go one way or another. And so it's exciting stuff and we can jump right into it. If you have a particular scenario or I can, I can uh, share a couple of things that were intriguing on my end, just watching. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, let's, let's look at some of, of those situations first where they seem non-critical. It's early in the game. There's a lot of time left the game. I'm, I'm watching and thinking of in particular is, you know, being a Browns fan, I'm, I'm watching that game and the very first possession drive all the way down, fourth and three, decide to go, which is no surprise. That's what they do. But they they come away with no points. And obviously every armchair quarterback can sit back and say, well, you know, you would have kicked that. You probably win the game. And Now that's that's uh, too much of a generalization because we don't know how, you know, the game is managed beyond that point. But I think when you look at early in the game, you know, compared to later in the game as the the amount of drives you might have left starts to decrease, you go from, you know, being pretty gray. It's a gray area. You know, you have to consider so many things, I think, to make that decision to go for it. As the game goes on, it gets easier. Everybody can make those decisions. But, you know, early on, I think coaches look at this in different ways. So I'd be interested in, in hearing about that part of the game where it's not so clear cut that this is what you should do. And certainly those are those are always the decisions that, uh, you know, as I said, the armchair quarterbacks will second guess you. And I know here in Cleveland, they're, they're already doing that all day long. So your thoughts on that? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. 
you know, I think the one thing is every coach and every team and every staff has a process, right? They, uh, there's a process how you game plan. There's a process how you go about making those decisions. And that decision in, in Cleveland, not, not being in the room, might have been something like, hey, fellas, we're, we're going for it on the first four down, fourth down if it's manageable. Uh, and that might have been said in the locker room, and uh, that might have been the game plan going in. Or that may have been the decision just based on feel uh, as, as early in the game. I think the one thing that has changed over the last number of years, you know, you look back at football and, and 10, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, so many teams were punting on, on fourth and one, less than one. You know, it, that was the, at least the mentality in pro football. Uh, now the analytics have really changed that decision making. And the numbers start telling us it is worth going for it. The numbers start telling us that the risk reward ratio is better, but I want to speak to the momentum that's hidden within those numbers because numbers tell us some things, but momentum swings, which is really what football is. We've all seen, seen or been a part of a game that a decision, uh, a stop on, on offense, a big play, uh, excuse me, a stop on defense, a big play on offense really changed the momentum of the game. And two thought processes there in regards to the Cleveland Brown decision. The one old school philosophy, right, which we've all heard is if every drive, every offensive drive ends in a kick, that's not necessarily a bad thing. It could be an extra point, could be a field goal, it might have to be a punt, but at least it's not ending in a turnover, uh, whether a physical one or a turnover on downs. The other flip side of it is, is what do you feel you need in that game? You need to be aggressive because you're missing some players or because you're missing some players, you take the points and you continue to stack the odds in your favor as the game goes on. And that's really what football is. I, and I got that expression from a, a good coach I worked for. He said, as the game goes on, we just want to stack the odds in our favor of winning the game. And it was such a simple statement, but really profound in his thinking, like, Take the three points, build on them, keep stacking them up, keep pulling points on the scoreboard. Uh, at some point in a game, you're going to have to go for it on fourth down. You're going to have to score a touchdown over field goals. You're going to have to do that for a number of different reasons. Either momentum, score dictates that, urgency dictates that. You know, you've kicked four field goals in a game in the red zone, so you're going to take a chance. But I think how you approach that situation and that decision making is so important as a staff. Um, and there has to be a process in there for you, whether the Browns, you know, discussed it prior to or made that decision in the heat of the game. I think one of those things is, you know, it's easy to look back and say they should have done this, they should have done that. But I'm more intrigued by what was their process and what was their thinking in that situation. You bring up a really good point about process. So if you are somebody who has subscribed to an analytics service and, and there's a few out there most popular uh, being championship analytics in the book. Uh, there's uh, uh, other ones out there too. And this is, this is starting to go down to the high school level. You know, a big part of this isn't that, oh, we got the book. You know, we're just going to open the book and we'll make the decision. Here's what it says. If you are adapting this, this becomes part of who you are, how you operate, things you're going to discuss in meetings, things your players are going to be aware of. Uh, this is why we do things, how we do things and really completely integrating education that has to be ongoing about those situations. And I think it puts your team in a, in a better place if you can better understand some of these things. I see so many games, especially going out and watching games on Friday night, that if there was an analytics approach, you would understand that ah, you, you probably didn't make the right decision in this situation. So uh, in, in looking at that, right, and thinking of especially some of those bigger processes that are going to be involved uh, from your standpoint and what you, you've done, what are those? Yeah, great question. So how you communicate, what, one of the things that is unique, and we, we tried to implement this when I was the head coach for the Edmonton football team, and I got this from some guys down south. And in the heat of the game, how can we, and, and, and as the stakes get higher, later in the game, how can we go about with the correct decision-making process? So I'll give you an example. Uh, let's say we're in four-minute mode, you know, and we use a color-coded system that helped communicate between, helped us communicate between the head coach, the offense coordinator, and defensive coordinator, 
of what we needed to do in that scenario. So, for example, if we were in four-minute mode and we felt our defense was playing well, we would say we're, we're in red mode. That means we're going to run it three times. We're going to burn clock. We're going to force them to use their timeouts. And if we have to punt, we feel good about that. If we would use the color we're in yellow mode, it would say, hey, you know, if you have to throw it, let's throw something smart. Let's, uh, let's try to burn the clock. But let's not let's not take a sack. You know that's what yellow kind of meant. Like let's let's take a our 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 series of most comfortable plays and see if we can get a first down. And if we were in green mode, basically what it meant was we absolutely have to get a first down, and do whatever you have to because we can't stop them defensively. And that came up in the in the Bills Ravens game yesterday. And you know everybody's going to criticize. Coach Harbaugh for going for it in that scenario. Why didn't you take the the field goal? But you know, I am 100% certain that they discussed it as a staff. We all saw that game, 19 first downs by the Bills in the first half. Uh, excuse, excuse me, in the second half they were marching up and down the field in the second, and the Ravens simply, you know, may have felt, hey, a field goal is not going to do us any good. We need to we need to take the touchdown. Uh, we need to go for it here. So. It isn't as simple as opening the book because the book will just give you the numbers of it. You don't know what's really going on on the, on the, on the entire thought process of it a little bit. But that's one of the processes that we used, and it's been helpful to alleviate communication because as an offensive play caller, when I hear a head coach tell me, hey, we're in, we're in yellow mode, that gives me an idea of how I'm going to sequence my plays hoping that we get a first down. If I hear we're in red mode, then we're getting, we're doing whatever we need to do to run the ball, get a first down, burn clock. So I think it, it helps communicate. It also helps you, and here's where it helped me a ton, when I was the head coach and the offensive play caller. You know, and so that's always tough when right. you're the head coach and a play caller on one side of the ball. You could easily switch and say, hey, you know, what are we in defensively? And so when the defense coordinator would tell me, we're in green mode, you got to go, that would give me a clue, and that would help alleviate, did I make that decision as an offensive coordinator or as a head coach to go for it or to throw it in a situation where you know, it might have been otherwise or, or, you know, the common fan would say, we should just, they should have just ran it here. So that was one of the things that we used, and that was really helpful, and, and that might have been a scenario, you know, what we saw yesterday in the game with the Ravens. So in looking at a, a system like that, I think it's highly effective to do those kinds of things, to know as a coordinator what mode you're in is going to help you narrow down the, the list of plays you want to call or open up your playbook. Uh, it's going to, when you know it ahead of time, especially, it's going to affect how you call it. It can't be get to fourth down, whether you have the tools or not for the analytics, whether you have the book, whether you have something else that that gives you that information uh, just as a coordinator knowing, you know, from, from the head coach hey, or the DC, um, we got to be in green mode. You got to go, right? Those are important things and it, it helps you be in the right frame of mind to what you're going to call. The question I have for you on that is the, the modes like that, when you've used those, have, have those been things that uh, players are aware of also? And is there a value to players understanding what mode you're in? Yeah, great, great question, Keith. And that's the whole key, and that's what what we do as as co you know people talk about situational football, and that's one of those scenarios, right? But there's so many aspects of situational football. Situational football could happen, like you mentioned at, at the start of this podcast, early in the game with the Browns, right? That's situational football as well. Are we going for it on fourth down, and trying to get seven, or are we kicking the field goal and get some momentum on an opening drive? But I think the other part of situational football is exactly what you allude to. It is how can we get our players to understand that what the situation is on the field and the importance of it, that they understand the significance of that play before that play happens, not post-fact. Like, oh, man, that was such a big play or a big situation in this moment. That's why I couldn't jump off sides. That's why I couldn't take a late hit on a quarterback. You know, understanding all those situations and translating them down to our players is so, so important because uh, football is, is, is not a game of do-overs. There are no do-overs in football, unfortunately. There is no line it up and run it again on game day. And so how you practice 
regardless of the level, high school, college, or pro, should be game-like in those scenarios, right? Because you, you can't create those scenarios in practice unless you create the stress that comes with those scenarios in practice. Um, so that they probably, when you feel stress, that's when you learn and you recognize those moments. And unless you're creating those scenarios in practice, it's hard to ask a player at any level to perform his best when the stress is the highest. And so I think it goes into how you practice, how you script your practices, how you create scenarios within practice to reinforce that situational football, whether it's putting the situation up on the scoreboard, you know, so everybody can see uh, fourth down and three, you're down by six, you're on the 42 yard line and, and everybody looks up at the scoreboard and knows exactly what the situation is. And then you rep that in practice. Those are some of the things that I think need to happen so that you put your players in the best possible situation so that they recognize it in the moment. It's whatever the situation might be, it's coming out. What am I expecting as a defensive player? The ball's on the one. I know I'm getting hard count. I can't jump off sides. This is such a crucial situation because if we can force them to punt out from the back end of the end zone, we're going to get great field position. And players don't necessarily need to – always think that way but we want to coach them to be able to recognize those scenarios and what's going to happen when you're backed up what's going to happen on in a two-minute situation and i'll give you an example you know something else that that, that's important in a two-minute mode uh, with a clock stopped you know do 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 teams call two plays in the huddle on first down you know we're we're running this and on, on what if we get a first down or if it's Second down, we're running the next play. And if it's an incomplete, we'll get back in the huddle and we'll call two more plays. That alleviates losing 10 seconds off the clock and communicating side to side, as we all tend to see sometimes. Now, obviously, the clock rules are different in pro football than college football. But I think all those situations speak to getting your players ready to understand the significance of that moment. Some really good points there. And one question I'll talk about, you just mentioned here the two-minute procedures and so we're we've gone into this era where so many teams now at every level can run no huddle right that's the mode they can run in you are in a critical situation like this and I've had these these thoughts before but what are your thoughts on a team that is always running no huddle in those situations when the clock is stopped to be able to get into the huddle and communicate things maybe there's some critical information between that receiver and quarterback maybe the you know it's the quarterback you know being able to uh, alert the line of of some you know blitz or whatever it might be um is that something you consider if you were a a no huddle team there maybe changing procedures to accommodate those you know those situations where you can share critical information yeah that's a great question i and and a tough one you know, the, one, I think it's important. It, it, football's a game of, of chess, right? You're trying to get 11 people and really 22 people to uh, react to, you know, the way you move. And, and you're trying to, as a, as a coach, create certain reactions in, in uh, defensive players or defensively and offensive players. So any time that you can communicate or that the quarterback can look at the, at the eyes of the, other 10 guys in the huddle and say, Hey fellows, man, just up front, just give me another click. If you can give me another click that, that, that dig route's going to come wide open and Hey, you know, Devante, make sure you take an inside release. If you get a cover two corner, cause that dig has been there all day. The Mike linebackers turning away from you, that stuff, which is what I think you're saying, Keith is crucial, especially in the heat of the moment. Hey fellas, because the quarterback understands this. We're in our give, uh, give ourselves up scenario. So there's there's 18 seconds on the clock. If we complete that dig route, you know, or eight seconds on the clock, if we complete that get, uh, uh, dig route, make sure you go down because we'll have time to to clock it and kick a field goal or take a last shot into the end zone. But we don't want to run out uh, the clock. All that stuff can be communicated in that hole in the crucial moment, and that's what. That's what we have to remember as coaches is that when the stress is the highest, that's when, and our, and our players are feeling the stress of the moment, that's when we need to simplify it and make it easy for them. And communication definitely does help you with that. On the flip side, Keith, right, 
the the counter argument to be would be uh, if it's not something you do in the heat of the moment, why would you change the the way you mm-hmm. operate, right? So there's some thought process there too on the flip side. So, but I'm always in favor of um, in those moments get everybody together, make sure 11 guys are on the same page, and you know I, I think you take advantage of those times whether you're a no huddle team or, or or a regular operation to make sure that the communication is clear and everybody knows what they're doing in that situation. Yeah, there certainly could be an argument, and and I would say if that's what you were going to do, that's you know probably back in camp how you install it. You know, the clock stopped in these situations. They're, we're going to we're going to huddle, um, whatever it might be. You know, it's it's to me one of those things, you know, if you slow down, maybe they're able to get more of an exotic blitz called or whatever it might be. So it's, you know, it's weighing those things in, in terms of it. I mean, defenses have gotten really good in using our offensive procedures to get calls in really quick and do it regardless. So I think it's uh it's definitely something worth exploring, um, but probably something that would have to be installed. And I think with all of this, though, you know, going back to what you said, putting time on the on the scoreboard, or to me, it's like, you know, maybe I wor- have a practice field that has no scoreboard. Well, you bring a whiteboard out there that's visible enough, and have a manager or an injured player put put some of those situations up on the board. You know that you could put on the script there too, and your your players look over and you know they're aware of what's going on. The game is always played in context. So while in practice, you know we may be out there running plays, the game's always played within the context of time, field position, down and distance. Right, all those things come into play. So understanding exactly what needs to be done what are the details of that situation I, br- I brought one up I, I mentioned to you I hadn't seen it for a while and was reminded of it watching uh, Green Bay you know as as it's coming down to uh, what's going to be the, the game winning kick they're running the ball one more time Aaron Rodgers turns around hands it off and instead of you know setting up on a, a play action fake or booting away on a play action fake he turns and he's following the running back, making sure that ball doesn't squirt backwards because if it does, he's on it and they're still kicking the field goal to win. So little things like that. I think the details in this game, the better you can coach them, uh, and this takes absolutely no tools. You don't have to have the analytics book or services or all those things, but you need to know what are the things my players must be aware of and have practice. I think that's the key. To tell them was one thing, but getting them to do and live out those things so that when it happens in in the game they're going to be able to do it two great points i want to i want to back up on on what you're saying so number one in those moments like you said you have to wrap them in practice and there's no doubt about it and in fact i would add another element drop down and do 15 push-ups as a team and as a coaching staff right before the scenario because when do those scenarios come scenarios come up in the fourth quarter when fatigue is setting in when you're not thinking as clearly right so Create an environment in practice where you drop down, do 15 push-ups, and then pose the scenario that's going to come up late in the, late in the game, and and add that element of catching your breath and fatigue and getting the call and communicating to each other in the heat of battle. That's number one. I think the second thing that you that you you know hit on that that cannot be overlooked is, do you want to be coaching this on you know and i'll just speak you know from a pro football perspective do you want to be going over this on monday with your players or do you want to be repping this on a thursday practice right and so many of us coach situational football post fact and fellas here's the situation you know uh, the dallas cowboys from last year you know the, the analytics told them something on the you know, on the clock, and, and unfortunately it cost them, you know, a, a, a chance at throwing the ball in the end zone in a playoff game. And that's not a criticism on, on them. That's just, unfortunately, that's a scenario where you're coaching that. We all were after that scenario came up. Post, we've lost the game, we're teaching. Or are you taking the time in training camp and practice to create those situ- situations so that you can show it on a Thursday practice, you know, a Thursday film session, a Friday film session and say, Hey fellas, this came up. And as coaches, I think one of the best things we can do when we're watching football and we're all football junkies, man, is wow, that situation right there. I'm going to take a a picture on my cell phone of the clock of the score. And I'm going to 
put that in my memory because I'd ask myself, what am I doing in that situation? What are we doing in this situation? And I'll give you an example. And it came up yesterday. And this is a this is a tough one, but this is one that is in those hidden pictures or those hidden moments of the game that analytics don't that, that are not in the book, right? And uh, the situation was that the Cowboys were playing Washington, and Washington is down 22 to 10 with eight over eight minutes to go in game, 8:02 on the clock. They're on the Cowboys' 15-yard line. Again, they're down by 12, but it's fourth and 15, right? And so uh, if you go by analytics, your chances of converting are, 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 are – the, the book is going to tell you you can't do that. But yet the book isn't going to answer the question of eight minutes left on the clock. Even if I take a field goal, we're down by nine. But now we don't need two touchdowns to win. We need a touchdown – and a field goal, which changes the field position, changes your strategy. And at the eight-minute mark, you start thinking, well, how many possessions do we have left? And we would all, you know, say that, okay, if you cut that time in half, uh, you got to go for it on fourth and 15. But that's a tough situation. And I don't know what the right answer is there, but the score is 22 to 10. If you take the field goal, it's a nine-point game, eight minutes left on the clock. Can you stop them? Can you hold the, you know, the the Cowboys with a backup quarterback to a three and out? Or will you be able to get one more possession on an onside kick and try to kick a field goal? But those are the situations that come up that you can you can never sit on a couch and think about. But as we're watching it, you take a picture of it and you say, Man, that's one worth discussing as a staff. And hey fellas, check out this scenario with the with the with the Browns. And hey fellas, check out this scenario with, you know, uh, the Bills and the Ravens or, or New England Patriots yesterday in overtime getting to midfield and getting close to field goal range, and, and they, but they've got a backup quarterback in a guy starting his first game, and it's third and five on the, on the opponent's 47-yard line. What are you doing? What are we calling? How are we handling the situation? Are we running the ball and playing, you know, uh, because on the other side of the field is, is a Hall of Famer. Uh, you know, that, that Rogers guy. And, and so do we, do we let ba- you know, Bailey throw it? Do we run it? Man, in the heat of the moment, when we're making those decisions, those are tough. Right. And, and, you know, but uh, those are the things that as a coach is we can all learn from because unfortunately we've all been on the other side of it where we've made a bad decision, where we've, you know, look back in retrospect, where we teach our players after the fact, uh, but I think all these things go into a library. You build them, you store them, you talk about them to staff, you teach them to your players, and that's how you have teams that are better at situational football than others. And that's true across every level of football. Yeah, it's it's about raising that player player's level of IQ, their football IQ and understanding those situations and really raising it ourselves. How are we going to coach those situations? And in, in looking at that in any season, it really – yeah, I think we've we've said the NFL, there's some parity. So it's not the NFL, but you look at college football, you look at high school football. There's a lot of those games that I mean, you don't need analytics. You, you don't need any special plays. You could go out and win the game because you have better players. And you know that going in. Unless something happens that is totally unexpected, there's injuries, whatever it might be, you know, you know that there's a high probability of winning those games. And I think those are the games – that you need to still find those situations. I think we let them go. Thinking of, of myself in those games, it, it, some of the things you worry about more, like the situational football and what are we doing, You know, what's our decision going to be when it's easier. I mean, I think it's the opportunity to practice and remind your players of those and, and keep those things installed and doing them in those games as well, even though they grow bigger. And, and your second team, guys, even with them, uh, you know, usually the concern you go to high school, I just want to get those hot guys, those JV guys who are, um, you know, typically not under the lights lined up and, and executing the play right. But I think you always have to look at those opportunities to coach it up and not letting, letting any of those go by because, as you said, you'd rather be teaching that ahead of time than going back and saying, here's what we should have done and this is why we lost the game. Yeah, and, and one other thing that I think is, is huge on that and, and – as you were talking, you you got my my brain working again this morning. So uh, the coffee hadn't kicked in. So uh, how does it feel 
to the other side of the ball. So we did a lot of situational and play it. And what I meant by what I mean by that, and and it's not revolutionary is, okay, put the ball in, uh, um, you know, uh, a a back, let's just use this, a backup situation and you're going to play it. You're going to put the ball on the two yard line and play it. And if your offense goes three and out and you have to punt, now put the second team offense on the field with a defense on a short field, right? So let's say your punt only gets out to the 40 or 45, and now the defense feels the stress of uh, being backed up, you know, or, or playing on a short field. So I think when you can, as a coach, create scenarios where you play it and then you flip it so that the other guys understand, man, if we don't get a first down offensively, if we don't get this ball out to the 20 and punt, this is what it feels like for our defense to be, you know, in, in a stress situation. And, and so that's another way of, of, of reinforcing the whole part uh, of complementary football, which ties into your situational football. But I've always been a big fan of those play scenarios and where you flip it. Uh, you know, you're in four minute mode, you got to get a first down. If you don't get a first down, then now your defense is in stress mode. So if we, if, if we don't, if we stop them, we feel good on defense. And uh, if we don't get a first down on offense, now we're the ones that are behind and we got to go two minute mode and have that feel on us. Right. And so I think anytime you can flip scenarios in a play it situation in practice is ideal. Yeah. I, I love that idea. And, you know, as the season wears on, I mean, we do get into our routines. We want players to have those routines, but you know, if you haven't been doing some of those things to, to be able to put those certain, certain situations into a practice just adds that much more level of focus and starts preparing you ahead of it. Maybe it doesn't happen this week, but maybe down the road in the playoffs, we got to face that situation. You've been in it before. And I like that idea of getting them to feel it, right? What's the, what's the consequences of, of us as an offense not executing and being able to see that in practice before you get into it in a game? I think that's a great idea. Yeah, I appreciate that. And, and that's a, uh... You know, I got that from somebody. That's that's what you know, football's all about. You you take bits and pieces from people. But I think, you know, uh, I've made the mistake. I'm sure other coaches made the mistake of, you know, in your in your Friday walkthrough in college football before the Saturday game. Hey, hey, let's go over our our, our got to have it's from the. You know, let's walk through our got to have it's from the eight yard line, the ten yard line. You know, uh, last play on the three yard line. Uh, let's walk through uh, hail mary. Let's walk. And sometimes you do a disservice by walking through them as opposed to having them rep them full speed. Uh, you know, and I'll give you an example of situational football. Can you steal possession, which Belichick has been a master at doing for years? Can you steal a possession before the half? Right. Right. So, you know, you defer, you're going to get the ball in the second half and situationally, Okay, uh, let's say that your defense is out on the field. Hey, I want to pressure these guys. I want to go after them because I want to steal possession, right? And so uh, force them to punt, give us a chance to get the ball. And what that does is it keeps the opposing quarterback off the field for a really long time. You know, so if you can steal a possession, you go into halftime, and then you get the ball in the second half, there could be a chunk of as much as 40 minutes of real time that the opposing offense isn't on the field, you know, but those situations come in and lead to, you know, what we call take a clear shot where it's right before the half you're in the fringe. Uh, you got 15, 20 seconds left on the clock. You want to make sure you come away with points. And so you say, these are the plays that we're repping on take a clear shot. And if it's there, we take a shot. And if it's not the quarterback throws out the back end of the end zone, because we're coming away with a field goal. Because how many times have we seen the momentum swing of a turnover in the red zone, you know, right before a half uh, and the momentum swings. And so, um, but I say those keep because those need to be rep full speed. They can't just be a, Hey, let's make sure I get through this on my, my walk through the day before. If you haven't rep those in practice, man, that's tough because uh, again, your players just don't get that that comfort of knowing this is what we're doing. This is the play we're calling. And it's one of two things when the game's on the line, right? Max pressure or max coverage. And, and it's, 
you're rarely going to see a zone blitz, you know, five-man pressure with a dropper. You're going to see one of those two scenarios, max pressure and max coverage in those situations. And so, you know, getting your understand your players to understand what are we doing if we come out and they, they give us a zero blitz look, what are we checking to? Are, you know, are we keeping the protection in? Are we having to throw a hot and get tackled, you know, or – uh, if they play max coverage, you know, how are we getting the back out and getting one extra guy? I think all those situational football scenarios, uh, the more you spend time on them, the better, the better a team you have. Well, Coach, certainly a lot to think about here, but some great ideas I think coaches can use right now in season. Maybe not all of them, but I think there's something in there that can help your team here as you go on. So be sure to check out our show notes where we list all of these detailed. We also have those in time. Those are on coachingcoordinator.com, usually about 24 hours after we post the show. And we share some additional resources, um, podcasts, videos, et cetera, that apply to that. So if any of these things were of interest to you, want to know more, or go back and and see them again, uh, be sure to check out the show notes at coachingcoordinator.com. Coach, Incredible conversation with you. It was great to have you on here. Certainly would love to have you back for a show in the off season and, and learn more about what you've done so far in your career and some of the other things you believe in, but uh, outstanding information that you shared here today. Appreciate you, Keith. Thanks for having me on, man, and good luck to everybody this week.